Good morning, everyone. Ambassadors, Excellencies, distinguished guests, all of our participants, welcome back. It is day two of the 10th China and Globalization Forum. And let's start with the Ambassadors Roundtable, Reimagining Multilateralism for a Multipolar World. Let's warmly welcome Dr. Wang Huayao, founder and president, CCG, former counselor to the China State Council, to chair this session. Let's welcome. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Room. And uh, so, good morning, Your uh, Excellencies and uh, distinguished guests, and also all the uh, dear participants of the 10th Annual China and Globalization Conferences. And uh, so, this is uh, day two, as uh, Room was mentioned, that we are starting our uh, uh, very exciting second day of the, uh, the 10th, uh, actually, this is 10th anniversary of uh, China Globalization Forum, and uh, which is uh, quite a, a big uh, uh, event, probably the largest uh, uh, event of the last 10 years for this forum. And we have covered many issues. Uh, yesterday we had uh, 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 a big open ceremony, we had a uh, uh, op uh, big roundtable opening, and of course we had uh, uh, China EU uh, uh, roundtable and discussions, and we had also uh, many uh, different uh, 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 sections. So this is really a great uh, uh, time to uh, contemplate and also to see where are we going. And, uh, and a lot of constructive and uh, uh, proposals and ideas and perspective has been generated. So today we are actually have another very important uh, roundtable section, which is reimagining multilateralism for a multipolar world. Uh, I remember uh, I was in Germany uh, uh, last year at the, uh, the Global Solutions Summit, actually this year also uh, there, and uh, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz actually said uh, that, that the unipolar world is, 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 uh, is, uh, is, is getting, uh, uh, probably is, is gone, but the uh, multipolar world is, is shaping, but we, we haven't really seen a multilateral, a multipolar world system, multilateral system to s sustain that. So. I mean, since the world, Second World War, uh, the global order has undergone transformative shifts from bipolar world, and it used to be Soviet Union and the US, and then uh, to a unipolar world uh, for many years, and now experience multipolar configurations probably uh, uh, happening. Now, however, the multipolar world today is characterized by a stunning uh, similarity of systematic crisis and also the uh, communication trend, uh, transactions and, and, and the interest and the values and, and all uh, very uh, uns unstable. So in the interdependence, the key thread of globalization has been really uh, you know, fading away uh, for, for, for quite, quite significantly and concurrently with the intensified uh, uh, major power rivalry competition and uh, so those challenges also underscore the urgency of reimagining multilateralism uh, for a multipolar world and uh, where the cooperation emerges as indispensable for addressing global challenges and advance shared interests. So countries uh, should align uh, their commerce, production, technology relationships, and also cooperation is still the pivotal for a more robust bilateral, polylateral, and multilateral uh, diplomacy on the world stage. So I'm, I'm very glad today we had uh, so many distinguished uh, guests and uh, distinguished ambassadors and, uh, uh, and, uh, and also uh, Chinese scholars and, uh, and, and also the, uh, the representative of different uh, sectors. Uh, the topic we're going to uh, explore and uh, discuss would be uh, first is the kind of new global order involved based on fundamentally on polarism or you know uh, now we have a lot of regionalism happening and 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 also multilateralism with uh, uh, what are the professional global solutions uh, relations that can create uh, pathways for mutual progress for multiple progress so if the current one <coughs> unipolar world or whatever is need a lot of uh, enhancement, a lot of uh, inf reform. How can we collectively uh, working on that? 
Uh, for example, we have many new challenges, uh, the AI, we have uh, climate, for example, we have uh, digital, we have uh, uh, global south debt, and, uh, and also the, uh, the poverty, and uh, uh, now even have war going on, you know, that, that is in Europe and the Middle East, it's, it's unimaginable that the world is not working together. So, so finally, what can be done to make a global governance more effective in a multivalent world? What are the alternative, uh, you know, what are the other solutions and, and, you know, lines that we can really work together to create a global, uh, uh, more uh, efficient decision making? So this is uh, uh, what I actually uh, hoping that we can touch upon uh, if we can have time. And also, what about, uh, the, you know, there's a, there's a, I remember last year uh, at uh, our conference in September, we had the China, EU, US. Uh, trilateral uh, cooperation on climate. So, so how about the U.S., China, and EU uh, can work together with Global South uh, to affect uh, <clears throat> the uh, uh, to, to meet the challenges and particularly to help uh, the the Global South together. And uh, so that is all those interesting uh, questions. So I, I I just want to <laughs> frame a little bit of our, our discussion. And we have so many think tank heads uh, here also from. Uh, different uh, 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 countries, and uh, we have a very good uh, representative of international uh, you know, university <laughs> president, deans, and, and all the people that we are having around tables here. So uh, I'm, I'm very uh, honored to chair this section, and uh, I think we'll, we'll start the round table. Maybe first round, we'll, each ambassador will have a six or so, maybe a bit more uh, t uh, time uh, to discuss, and after that, we'll, we'll have a uh, more, uh, maybe if we have time, we have some more uh, interventions and discussions again. So I, I just start this uh, maybe uh, randomly. I, I, I see uh, 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 Ambassador Toledo, uh, you representing, you know, EU, 27 countries. <laughs> so maybe you speak first, and uh, and then and then we'll we'll, we'll just uh, uh, you know uh, follow the, the, the seats and to speak again. So Ambassador Toledo, your turn, please. Thank you very much, uh, Henry. Thank you very much, uh, CCG. Thank you very much, Mabel. Uh, I'm here every day. Uh, <laughs> I was here uh, yesterday. Uh, and I'm here. I'm very glad to be here to discuss a very timely subject, multilateralism in the current world. Um, and thank you for giving me the floor in the, uh, as the first speaker. Um, well, in fact, we are a multilateral organization. Also, the European Union is a multilateral organization, probably the most advanced, well, probably not, definitely the most advanced regional multilateral organization, so advanced that we are one. We are one and 27, but we are, uh, th there is no other international organization that speaks with one voice as the European Union. We speak with one voice and through our common institutions in things like as important as trade. Uh, we speak with 27 voices and we try to get one single voice in uh, increasingly so in foreign affairs. Um, but we uh, are definitely the most advanced integration organization and mul uh, in, in the multilateral world. Um, reform of the multilateral system is, a const is constant in uh, the agenda of our meetings around the world and especially with China. We are now uh, preparing for the summit of the future in September and this is a good occasion uh, to reflect on the current conversation on the multilateral world. Mm, the future of multilateralism is a subject that High Representative Vice President Borrell has been addressing during his mandate, including during his visit here in Beijing uh, when he came last year for the EU-China strategic dialogue, and including in the EU-China summit last December 7th. As he 
Borrell put it, we live in a more and more multipolar world, but unfortunately, multilateralism is in retreat. And the problem with a multipolar polar world, or an increasingly multipolar world, where multilateralism, true and effective multilateralism, is in retreat, is that it leads to fragmentation. We're going from globalization to fragmentation. That's why we need to reinforce our multipolar polar system. How do we do this? Well, there is a very simple way in the first place, is to reinforce, to align, and to insist on the basic tenets, the basic principles of the UN Charter. The core principles of the UN Charter that should apply universally. China, as a member of the, of a permanent member of the UN Security Council, has a special responsibility to protect the basic rules, the basic principles of the Charter. We must defend the UN Charter in its entirety, and we must defend it in all occasions. Second, we agree that the multilateralism, the multilateral order can and should be and should improve. It must respond better to calls or demands for transparency, quality, inclusivity, and delivery. But again, that doesn't mean that we have to be selective on core principles. We have to apply all principles and apply them universally. The UN, which is at the basis of a multilateral system, works on three essential pillars. Peace and security, sustainable development, and human rights. They are inextricably linked. They have to be complied with universally. There can't be different narratives on core principles. The basic principles have to be applied equal equally everywhere by everyone. There are no shortcuts. There should be no justification. For instance, when we talk about territorial integrity or sovereignty. There is no justification, and you know what I mean, no justification, there is no legitimate security concerns, there is no justification in a def a defective security architecture that can justify what has happened in Ukraine. That's what I mean. So, we cannot compromise on this basic principle. Otherwise, this will lead to fragmentation and to conflict. And then, when we talk about sustainable development, uh, there are new things coming up new things that have to be addressed multilaterally. Because if they are not addressed multilaterally and effectively, it will also lead to fragmentation, it will also lead to, to uh, conflict. And I'm talking about such new basic things as artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence has enormous potential to shape our economies and the world for the better but it also has the potential to put the multilateral and peace and stability and development at risk. So we have to regulate this multilaterally. Let me finally, because I am, I run, I'm running out of time, 
turn to a concrete upcoming initiative to help reshape the world multilateral system. I'm talking about the Summit of the Future, which will be hosted by the UN General Assembly in September 24. This high-level event will mark the culmination of a four-year-long process started in 2020 on the occasion of the UN 75th anniversary. This is a crucial opportunity to enhance cooperation on critical challenges and strengthen global governance for the sake of present and future generation. We, the EU, are playing a leading role in the preparation of the summit, pushing for a high level of ambition and advocating a text anchored in key values and priorities, including the respect of universal and basic human rights, women and girls empowerment, as well as climate change and biodiversity. The summit should adopt an ambition and action plan, including new commitments, and has to have a forward-looking vision with concrete measures and timelines, rather than focus only on what has already been agreed. The overriding focus of the pact should be both the establishing a common vision on the future and on identifying concrete ways in which multilateralism with the UN at its core can promote that vision. And uh, I will leave it there because I'm running out of time. There are many speakers uh, that will take the floor. Thank you very much, Henry. And uh, I'm uh, looking forward to start the discussion. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank, thank you, thank you, Ambassador Toledo uh, from the European Union. So I think you 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 give a very good uh, overview uh, of of the topic of the today, uh, how to reimagine the multilateralism and uh, what can we do to improve that. And absolutely, uh, uh, you, you 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 showcase the EU. I mean, the European Union is probably one of the I would say probably the most successful. A multilateral project or, 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 of the post-Second World War and probably the largest peace project that we ever had. I mean, we remember the first, first World War, Second World War all happened in Europe. And, and now, you know, that, that, that we have to avoid the, the third one. So, so absolutely, uh, EU is, uh, is a, a peace project and a multilateral example. And I totally agree with you. We, we really need to uh, a bit by the, the UN uh, principles and the UN Charter. That, that's absolutely the cornerstone. And uh, uh, ab uh, so, so I think sometimes when, when Western countries talk about rule-based, maybe we should really specify, you know, it's a UN rule-based, or <laughs> it's a, and, uh, and yes, the UN is, is an international law-based, you know, so, so let's be specific, you know, rather than people think about rule-based, maybe it's a G7 rule, or, you know, then <laughs> UN rule is absolutely everybody uh, would accept. So thank you. And uh, and I agree, you know, we, we need to, uh, you know, stick to the principle, but also how to improve on AI and, and many other uh, new, new emerging phenomena that we have to work together. So I'm very glad that you set a good uh, team for, for our discussion as well. So absolutely, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're seeing the unipolar world is, 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 uh, is gone, but then a multipolar world is shaping, but there's no system to really sustain that. And we have to improve, enhance, and, uh, and enlarge. Uh, that's why I think all the ambassador knows your country policy very well, and we would like to hear from you. Uh, next, I would like to uh, have Ambassador Patricia Flo. Uh, you know, you're from Germany, and uh, the, the uh, you know probably the the third largest economy, and uh, uh, you know is really important in the EU. And uh, uh, so, so Germany has a lot of uh, roles to play, and particularly in the, um, also a strong support of multilateralism and even multipolar world, because uh, that's what I heard from uh, Ola Schatz. So maybe uh, Ambassador uh, Flo, your turn, please. Uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Wang, and thank you. It's a pleasure to be here once again uh, at the um, CCG together with colleagues, um, both from um, all over the world and from China. Uh, first of all, um, uh, thank you for choosing this topic because um, I think it will be key for all of us on this world how we structure the multilateral world um, together. And let me say up front that multilateralism, it has never been static and it has actually always been multipolar, if you look at it. So um, 
let me say that at this particular point in time, what we need is um, a more efficient multilateral system because we must address the multiple crises that affect um, the global community as a whole. That means, um, of course, um, the climate um, crisis, um, environmental pollution, uh, Russia's illegal war of aggression, challenges in the world economic system, social justice, uh, the weakening of um, uh, human rights and, and, and women's rights. So, um, based on this, let me outline a few uh, key conditions I see for the reform and the development of the multilateral system. First, uh, I would urge not to start by dismantling the achievements in consensus, in dispute settlement, and in legal norms, international law, that we've worked hard to build. And they, these rules were never, you know, rules of a small group, G7. I negotiated on the, you know, the, uh, uh, the, women's, the Beijing Women's Conference, uh, the Cairo uh, Agreement on Climate. It was always really encompassing everyone. And that we need to preserve it and take it as a starting point. Second, um, now, uh, if we, we want to address um, these multiple crises, and so therefore we cannot do this through inward-looking isolationism. Uh, on the contrary, we need to look for more cooperation, more integration, and more peaceful adaptation of our institutions, including the international financial system, the, the markets, the WTO, uh, and of course the UN um, itself. Thirdly, now um, we have to communicate in a responsible, constructive, and solution-oriented manner. I'm saying this because I hear too many narratives which divide, or aim to divide, which vilify others, other groups, other countries, and therefore create discord rather than trying to find common ground. Now, having said that, um, I think the starting point should always be to accept that others, big or small, and from whatever region, have interests and, and worldviews of their own that deserve to be respected and to be factored into our decision making. Now, that's, I think, why the UN Secretary General, Mr. Guterres, convened the UN Summit um, for the Future. And it's a process where Germany, together with Namibia as co-chairs, lead the negotiations um, in New York. And yes, we want a concrete action program on sustainable development, peace and security, science and technology, transformation of global governance. Now, Henry, let me address some of the uh, questions that you, you asked. Now, first of all, your first question. Now, the global order, as I said, should evolve based on true pluralism. But that also means that true pluralism means the arduous work of consensus building, negotiation, and agreement. No way around that. And I also would say it's not really about a new global order. We, don't, we, we shouldn't discard what we have. And so the way should be to look at a reform that makes our global order fit for purpose, for, for the tasks and the challenges that we, that we confront. Now, your second question. Um, now, do we need alternative multilateral platforms? Uh, I have doubts about that because what I said was that we need to gather everybody around the table and we have the institutions already that, that do that. And um, by the way, we've always had the different multilateral fora. I mean, not only the EU as an organization, but the ASEAN, the African Union, the League of Arab States, the BRICS, you, you name it. And of course, all of that feeds into this greater you know, uh, process. But I think that the key is we have the United Nations and the system at the core, and we need to strengthen them. And we need to look at the complementarity between the different uh, platforms. Uh, and then I, let me also make a comment, because the rules, they were never made by a small group. If we look at the United Nations Law of the Seas, I mean, it was a very complicated 10-year negotiation until we arrived finally uh, at a result. Now, your third question, uh, 
governance and how to make um, the international, the multilateral system more efficient. I couldn't agree more. We need to address some of the inefficiencies. And uh, let me point out one, and we've seen uh, that the U Security Council in a time of geopolitical tension and crisis is even less able to act than it was um, for the last 20 years. So we need to urgently reform the Security Council and together with many, many other countries, um, Germany has been an advocate um, for reform. And also we need to address the new challenges and let me mention governance of artificial intelligence, autonomous weapon systems, outer space. So we can't you know, remain in the old framework. We also need to look at what new institutions do we actually need. So um, let me then uh, also um, uh, highlight that um, uh, we of course need um, uh, coalitions across countries and across regions. So. I think what we should leave behind, and I remember that in, in previous um, rounds of negotiations we had you know, the EU and the G77 and so that still works, but I think increasingly we share interests across borders and across um, uh, continents, and so therefore we should also look at intensifying our, our dialogue with um, our African friends, with our Asian friends. Your last question, uh, what's the role of China? Now, there's no question that China is um, a global power and as a, uh, a P5 permanent member of the Security Council has uh, a really um, big um, uh, also responsibility in this regard and whatever China does matters for the multilateral order as a whole and for our ability to steer reforms in the multilateral system because the more we have conflicts with China and among us, the weaker is our ability to collectively address uh, you know, some of these issues. So we, we see that geopolitical conflicts do um, hamper global decision-making ability and um, China has a key role to see how we can address that, including going back to the agreement with Iran on you know, Iran not going nuclear. Uh, so, stemming the proliferation of nuclear weapons, same of course for um, North Korea. So, as we have all a shared responsibility to handle our relations constructively bilaterally, we should always have in mind that this is about also protecting the common good globally and to, to improve the global order that we've already built over so many decades. So let us work together to make the summit for the future of the United Nations in September a success and let us all recommit to a multilateral system with um, the United Nations at its core. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Patricia. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the United Nations at core for multilateralism is still uh, should be strongly upheld and uh, very important. Uh, uh, I agree with you that uh, we need to strengthen those uh, multilateral institutions and particularly WTO, which is also a bedrock of global prosperity for, for so many decades. Uh, I think when I say alternative, it doesn't mean that we're going to have a new system. We, we want to uh, for example, on, on some of the new emerging uh, uh, phenomena like, like AI, like uh, climate, we have needed some new mechanism or new alternative to, to, to strengthen the multilateral cooperation. Uh, the current global system, absolutely, we need to enhance, improve, enlarge, uh, and then China is strong support of that and it doesn't want to replace any uh, system already function there and you just want to make it more uh, um, opti optimized. So, so thank you for your uh, uh, in, intervention and, and you know, show your thought and those uh, consensus building, I totally agree, <laughs> we, we, we should do more consensus building uh, uh, from, from uh, Europe, uh, US and China and, and, and the world, of course, global south together. Uh, again, thank you. So, so next I would like to invite uh, our friends from Africa and because <laughs> Ambassador uh, C Seely uh, is a uh, Old friend, and uh, you've been, uh, you, were, you, were, you had many important posts uh, in, in Africa, South Africa, before as a former minister and many, many uh, positions. But you've been in China for some time, I, I know you. So, w why don't you share your perspective from African point of view? 
Thank you very much, Dr. Wang, and uh, for giving South Africa to add its voice to this important topic. First, the multilateral cooperation, primarily through the United Nations system, has characterized the post-Second World War global order with various levels of success. While it has been imperfect, this multilateral cooperation has averted direct military confrontation between major powers and has spared the nations to recognize and take joint actions in addressing international sustainable development and human rights issues, as colleagues have said. However, <clears throat> what's the problem? The system is facing challenges such as growing unilateralism, geopolitical rivalries, inconsistent compliance with and at some times blatant violation of international law and the application of double standards. This has led to steady erosion of trust and competition between states, is, which is weakening the ability of the international community to work together to address the shared challenges, such as peace and security, uh, ensuring global sustainable development, addressing climate change and environmental challenges, and protecting human rights. <coughs> Thirdly, it has also, <coughs> there has been also been a proliferation of alternative forums and side processes outside the established multilateral forums where decisions are taken amongst a few, thereby disenfranchising many and diverting attention away from non-delivery of multilateral commitments. Then what can be done to reimagine this uh, multilateralism and the multipolar world? First, South Africa, we believe that multilateralism, which is a notion of collective, collective solutions, must be at the heart of the engagement between member states, started the member states, guided by the UN Charter, as colleagues have already mentioned. The new momentum and political will is then required to strengthen and transform these multilateral relations. The United Nations must remain at the centerpiece of this multilateralism and be modernized and reformed to make it fit for purpose and more effective, agile, action-oriented, forward-looking, as well as inclusive and uh, representative of the current geopolitical relations and inter international community. There should be a collective recognition, however, that the United Nations and, and its regional bodies, such as the AU, EU, and other bodies, <coughs> remain the most relevant global and international platform for tackling challenges such as threat to peace and security, addressing poverty and underdevelopment, and ensuring protection of human rights all of which these three pillars are the pillars of the United Nations uh, <coughs> uh, in, in, in is implementing its mandate. So the reforms, similarly acknowledging the need for reforms of the organization, including the Security Council, it must be acknowledged at the same time that the organization has made immense contribution to the advancement of these pillars. Because if we lose that and uh, just criticize everything, I don't think we're. This third point that really we suggest in going forward that it must be pointed out that <clears throat> equal importance and priority must be given to development as, uh, and, and security, not just security, but development and security. And, uh, uh, because the matters of peace and security and development, the, the nexus has been established already. You can't address one and leave another. And fourthly, we, as colleagues have said, that now we face these new things which brings potential good but potential risk, like the artificial intelligence. As South Africa, we support that 
we should develop standards at the United support development of standards at the United Nations level so that we can benefit all of us benefit and minimize threats or possibility of these uh, technologies to fall under the the bad hands and lastly <coughs> uh, <coughs> when other cooperation mechanisms are established outside the United Nations system, these must not erode or undermine the UN, but complement it. Uh, as an example, for instance, uh, my country also belongs to BRICS partnership. We belong to G20. We are of the view that these always put multilateralism at the center. So they are not eroding uh, the UN Charter and the UN system on its own. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Seyabona. And uh, uh, excellent remarks, actually. Uh, I think that uh, you're absolutely right. I, I hear all the echo of uh, old ambassador talk about uh, of you. I mean, that's, that's the most uh, uh, emphasized that, that we still have to, you know, have the UN rule-based uh, uh, global order that we have to continue to strengthen. And of course, uh, you, you mentioned about, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the global south, of course, uh, you need more voice. Uh, I, absolutely, I think in this multipolar world, we need more voice from the global south. I'm glad that uh, African Union become G20 now. We, we should call G21 <laughs> instead of G20 now. And, uh, and of course, we we'll say ASEAN, the EU, of course, is there, ASEAN, and, uh, and particularly the BRICS countries. I mean, we see the BRICS double last year, and then there's another 20-some countries lined up to, to join the BRICS. So, so how can we get multi, you know, multilateral system working cohesively together is, is where you're still in that process and working on that. I totally agree with you that, uh, uh, you know, priority is still the development. We should not overemphasize security. You know, probably human, global human security is more important rather than national security. So, so collectively, we need to strengthen the, the human security and priority of development uh, as, as key. I, I, I think that was a good idea as well. Uh, thank you. Now I'd like to invite the Amb Ambassador Ma. Um, Ambassador Ma, he's the uh, uh, Ma Jianchun. He's a uh, uh, CCG now resident senior fellow, but he was the formal Chinese ambassador to Gambia and, in, and also director general of Move County Department of Foreign Affairs. So very glad that uh, you can join us today. Ambassador Ma, please. Uh, hello, uh, everyone. Good morning. It's my great pleasure to participate in this uh, ambassador roundtable to discussion uh, to discuss uh, globalization and uh, multilateralism and the multipolarization of the world with the ambassadors and the experts here. Uh, so uh, I, I used to work in Africa as a diplomat for more than 10 years. So when I, when I uh, got this invitation, so I, I just, uh, I, was, uh, I was on my traveling. So I think so maybe I can use this chance to say some words uh, on the, uh, how, uh, to say some words on how China's diplomatic relations with the Global South will affect the next step uh, in shaping the, the countries of the multilateralism. This is just uh, the question raised by CCG, one of the questions. So I think I, I can share some views with my dear colleagues and experts. So the Global South is an important aspect of the multi-level uh, world in the face of great challenges unseen in the century. Uh, China attaches great importance to cooperation with countries in the Global South, including with African countries. So I would like to say that Africa is an important part of the Global South and in the new global order, in the process of building a new multilateralism and realizing globalization, China believes that the existence and influence of Africa cannot be ignored. Africa's importance to the world is not only reflected in its geographical location, 
Africa also has abundant resources, a vast market, uh, and a population of more than 1.4 billion in this continent. Accounting for 17% of the world population, uh, which will reach 2.4 billion by 2025. So how can globalization be done without the participation of the countries of this continent? And also, Africa has 54 countries, 20% of the 193 member states of the United Nations. And the role and the role and influence of Africa, African Union are constantly expanding. The AU's role is uh, constantly expanding. So multilateral, multilateral this cannot be without such a force. African countries very much want to participate in the process of economic globalization and are also willing to take an active part in the process of multipolarization of the world. Uh, one of the obvious policy orientations is that the African Union has put forward seven broad visions on behalf of African countries in the Ag Agenda 2063, one of which is to build Africa into a strong, united, dynamic, and influential international actor and partner that contributes to human process and well-being. In practice, uh, in recent years, we can we witness that openly uh, African countries have been actively playing an influential role in international affairs and the peace and the peace processes. Uh, and African countries also have actively engaged in uh, cooperation in Africa. And in the year 2021, uh, Africa began, African countries began to implement the Africa Free Trade Area Agreement. We can see that African countries hope to increase trade, attract foreign investment, increasing production capacity, promote economic development among African countries, uh, and develop towards economic globalization through tariff uh, liberalization and the elimination of tariff uh, barriers. So uh, the Chinese government has always uh, attached the importance to, to cooperation with the global south, including the African countries. Uh, such cooperation has played a positive role in promoting economic globalization and the development of the multi-level world. Uh, uh, the, I think there is one thing worth noting that is the, the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, which established by China and African countries uh, in the year 2000, uh, before the year 2000. This is a good platform for plurilateral cooperation. And the achievements of the FOCAC are conducive to the development of globalization. On uh, this platform, China and African countries jointly discussed uh, the direction of the development uh, and try to align this, uh, their uh, development strategies and implement some project according to the needs of African countries. Uh, so it should be pointed out that the economic cooperation between China and Africa is also an open cooperation. In recent years, the Chinese government has encouraged Chinese enterprises in Africa to actively carry out uh, three-party cooperation, including between China, African countries, and other countries. So uh, China, uh, African countries have nearly 3 billion people, accounting for about 37% of the world's 8 billion people. Therefore, strengthening cooperation with African countries and participating in the process of economic globalization with African countries will make
positive contributions to the development of globalization and will also have a positive impact on the form formation of the framework of multilateralism. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Ma, and uh, for your also uh, very good remark on the, on the potential multilateralism, how, to, how we can reimagine multilateralism. Uh, uh, absolutely, African and uh, you know, the youngest continent in the world has, has an enormous role to play uh, as, time, as time to come. So, so I agree with you. This is very important. Uh, the multilateralism, we should really consider the uh, vast developing countries and their voices and how to incorporate that. And, and, and actually, uh, you know, uh, China and EU and US, you know, all the uh, big countries could you know, cooperate more in helping African countries and, and some, some polylateralism uh, which is needed to support the development of, of Global South. So thank you again. And uh, so next I would like uh, to invite another, uh, uh, you know, big country from, from uh, you know, the region, it is uh, His Excellency Ismail Haki Masad, Ambassador of Turkey to China, to share your view. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President, the Excellencies, dear guests. I join my pre the predecessors, pre the, the other speakers, when they say that this uh, this is a really timely event. Once again, once again, CCG is taking lead. Thank you to you, Mr. President, and to your team. And thank you for inviting me. The issue at stake is important today, multilateralism. In fact, in fact, we are speaking about the reform system of the United Nations. Mr. President, since Alexander the Great, too many effort has been deployed to have a peaceful, sustainable uh, world order. Throughout history, we have we had too many different experiences. The current system is established after the end of the Second World War. I think this is worth to mention it in order to try to find out efficient solution. What are the deficiencies? In fact, the post-1945 liberal international order has prevented the outbreak of a new world war. This is true. Nevertheless, it has fallen short of offering sustainable peace and security for all. After the fall of the Berlin Wall, the discussions of the world order from unipolarity to bipolarity and finally to multipolarity are the symptoms of a problem in the current global governance mechanism. These discussions prove that current global governance mechanisms are unable to address global challenges timely, fairly, and effectively. We continue to call for a UN reform and other multilateral organizations in order to create a just and fair new order. The school is particularly opportune at a time when escalating competition among great powers intensifies global tensions and fosters polarizations on a global scale. The international system faces a multitude of political, military, economic, environmental, technological and social challenges. None of these challenges are confined by national borders and no state can tackle them alone. These challenges indicate the pressing necessity and inevitability for the international system 
to undergo a substantial transformation. The system, as envisioned by us, evolves beyond the traditional concept or an international order defined by polarity, whether unipolar, bipolar, or multipolar. We seek a more inclusive, effective, fair, and secure international system capable of addressing current global and regional challenges. The world needs a robust system based on solidarity rather than polarity. The world needs to focus on investing in new and clean technologies as well as research and development, innovation and digitalization, rather than tackling crisis and wars. Mr. President, last but not least, we know that <clears throat> throughout the history, the new systems and world orders, as we call it, they were established after major conflicts. This was the case at the end of the First World War and also the case after the Second World War. Now, if we need a substantial reform of the United Nations system, shall we need for a second or third or fourth major conflicts? I think that humanity, international community should avoid that I think we almost agree on some inefficiencies of the current system. Let's not wait for a major conflict in order to reform it. And I join Ambassador Toledo and the other speakers, Patricia Flor as well, <clears throat> when it comes to the importance of the future summit in September to tackle in a serious and comprehensive way the future reform of the United uh, Nations. But the global governance needs more, I think. There are other international organizations. The current system is not representative at all. I think we agree on that. And Ambassador Ma is right when he points out the importance of the Global South and the African countries. We have G20, we have uh, some other regional organizations, of course we have uh, European Union, we have OIC representing more than 50 countries. The future reform initiatives should be inclusive. Without that, without that, I think no way out. And of course, of course, this means at the same time a huge responsibility first for the permanent member of the United Nations Security Council, China included. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Musa, yeah, for your also very uh, wonderful uh, remarks as well. I, I, I agree with you that uh, uh, we can't wait a uh, uh, third world war to happen before we reform the UN. Uh, 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 you know, we, we are having actually a new Britain world moment after, after the the largest uh, COVID-19, uh, you know, the world virus war. I mean, we already have that. You know, probably 10, 20 million people lost life on that, and that we should really wake up to to reform our system, uh, and, and uh, I'm very pleased to see actually countries like Turkey and, and uh, some African countries was active in mediating the conflicts uh, between Russia and, 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 and Ukraine, and, and of course China is part of that. So you see for when the multilateral system is not functioning well, I mean those regional, those uh, uh, other countries would, would also you know, have to take more active role there, but I really will hope that we can solve this at, uh, at UN uh, umbrella, and let's strengthen the UN and, and all work together. So, so absolutely uh, correct uh, your 
some of your great views. Uh, now I'd like to uh, invite uh, uh, also Ambassador from New Zealand, His Excellency Graham uh, Malton. I mean, uh, New Zealand is a very, very interesting country. I, I just come back from New Zealand last week. It was very impressive. Uh, there, was a, there was a China Business Summit uh, in, in uh, Auckland, attended by 500 people in New Zealand business community, and uh, New Zealand you know, Prime Minister was there, Chinese Ambassador was there. I, I also gave a talk there. Very good, uh, very good. But I think New Zealand, you know, we'll, we'll talk about those multilateral system. You know, CPTPP New Zealand is, uh, is one of the founders, and, uh, and, and now you are also p part of the RCEP, the largest free trade agreement uh, in the world, and then you are initiated DEPA, Digital Economic Partnership Association. So probably you can share your, your views uh, uh, from, the, from the front of New Zealand. Yeah. Well, Dr. Zashan Ha, thank you. Um, thank you, Henry. We're delighted to get you and, and Mabel to New Zealand, and uh, thank you for the participation uh, in the conference uh, last week. Uh, I'd just like to acknowledge my uh, fellow speakers as well. I very much enjoyed listening to the perspectives that they had shared so far on this important topic. Uh, multilateralism matters to us um, because it addresses issues that go beyond individual countries and cultures, uh, issues on which we need to develop common global approaches and common global rules uh, if we're going to get general benefit. It doesn't mean those issues are easy, almost by definition it means they're hard. Uh, and we see the multilateral system as being under real pressure. Uh, since the Second World War, as a, you know, we would say a medium sized but others would possibly say a small country, uh, New Zealand has engaged in the multilateral system uh, with the conviction that the development of agreed international rules and norms is the best way for us to achieve our security and economic interests. And we have, for much of that time, benefited from a relatively stable strategic environment and an international system that was steadily delivering more for us and for our interests. During that time, the world's generally become more open and the international system has engaged more and more countries. Uh, obviously, that trend accelerated with decolonization, with the end of the Cold War, with technology development, uh, and with strengthened impetus for liberalization in different areas. And for us, particularly trade, as represented by the conclusion of the Uruguay Round uh, and the formation of the World Trade Organization. In the 1990s, from different bases, the other big factor that has happened is the emergence of the two giants of the world uh, that were uh, steadily becoming more engaged with the international system in China and India. And both have taken radical steps towards greater economic liberalization and engagement with the world economy and with world politics. At the same time, capital and manufacturing that's been linked to the US, to Japan and Europe found this very complementary to its interests for a period and has certainly invested and made a big difference in the way that these countries have emerged. And New Zealand has also benefited from new market opportunities and certainly from the incorporation into international trade rules for the very first time of agriculture, an important export sector of ours. But those foundations which underpinned our foreign trade and economic policies have certainly shifted in a seismic way in the first quarter of this century. We have witnessed more conflicts, a failed international trade round and increased economic barriers and protectionism, a global economic crisis, a pandemic, and a decline in the effectiveness of international institutions to be able to cope with the pressures placed upon them by the broader demands of evolving national states and, and their competition. So those deteriorating trend lines take us further away from the rosier assumptions about openness in the international environment that New Zealand favours. And regrettably, the negative trends have really accelerated, particularly in the security space, over the last three years uh, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine and the continuing tragedy in Gaza. We remain strongly committed to multilateralism, though, as the only way in which we can solve big complex issues. So amidst the depressing indicators, what do we see as the answers? We do acknowledge that the world has managed to avoid full global conflict since 1945, as several of my panelists have said. And that is an enormous achievement in an era of unprecedented change and in which the UN has played a major role. And when we look at multilateralism and whether it has succeeded or failed, we need to acknowledge that multilateralism is not really separate from us. Uh, it is actually the collective representation of our ability uh, to manage the big challenges that we have together. 
So within that international order, we do look for what we can agree on. And within that international order, we do see some key principles that are common to almost everyone, whether one is an advocate of the status quo or an advocate of more radical change. And New Zealand will continue to support and defend the key ideas of the international rules-based system, including all of those embedded in the UN, its institutions and its founding documents. State sovereignty, territorial integrity within internationally agreed borders, resolution of conflict through dialogue, international law-based freedom of navigation and overflight, and universal human rights. And we do see multilateral forums as the places where we can collectively address the greater challenges that the world faces. But that includes taking some big steps. There needs to be action on security. The United Nations Security Council has a clear role that it needs to play. For those powers that have the privilege of global leadership comes with a very acute responsibility. And the Council needs to look hard at reform of the use of the veto, a system that we've opposed since the formation of the UN. There needs to be continued action on climate change and climate mitigation and delivery on climate financing. Weather events of what we hear are unprecedented severity uh, appear to be reported most weeks, as are droughts and record temperatures. They won't abate unless we undertake collectively uh, what we have to do, and we basically know what we have to do, and do it better. Critical to the support of global systems for the smaller countries and small island states is also action on this issue. And it will be a critical issue, the most critical issue, that's discussed at the Pacific Island Forum and in the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting when it meets in Apia later this year. Plurilateral action and the development of trade treaties are also going to be a factor. The proliferation of preferential agreements has occurred because of our collective inability uh, to reach new universalist WTO outcomes. And so, in looking forward, we need to look at both how we can improve outcomes there, but also how we can ensure that the preferential deals that do occur uh, in the gap between rounds are flexible and open to economies who can embrace the terms on which they are structured. Liberalisation in trade is not a current trend, uh, but it is essential if global goals on food security, on climate, on development and migration are ultimately to be delivered. The environment has actually been an area in which multilateralism has continued to deliver slightly better than in some other areas. Addressing biodiversity loss is obviously a shared issue for many countries and it is very important. We're deeply concerned about, about both terrestrial and marine biodiversity loss, but we do acknowledge the conclusion of the global biodiversity framework, the Kunming Montreal Biodiversity Protocol in 2022 was very welcome and it needs to be fulfilled. I'll just make one very brief remark too, um, because multilateralism is very important uh, for how small island developments, developing states, uh, are engaged in the international system. In my region, small states in the Pacific very much rely on collective action to undertake global challenges that they have virtually very little influence on changing, including sea level rise and sustainable economic development. Multilateralism speaks a great deal to abstract ideas of security and welfare, and it's very welcome that it does so, and it's important that it does so. But immediate, immediate needs are apparent too. And the impact of climate change in these states and in the states around us is very real. It's real now, and it needs genuine action. New Zealand is very honoured in this uh, circumstance to be playing a leadership role in the United Nations and preparing for a high-level meeting on sea level rise in September and it would encourage general engagement on that topic. Others have talked about regional organisations, and I'm probably out of time, so I won't speak to those, but they do play a very important role in our region and also in others. Uh, and we expect that the engagement and contribution of regional organisations and other UN forums is fully reflected in the broad agenda that we'll be engaged on in the Summit of the Future, uh, convened under the auspices of the UN Secretary-General this September. And we wish... Namibia and Germany, uh, all the very best in pulling together with the Secretary General a very effective and good agenda for that meeting. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Graham. Absolutely. I mean, New Zealand, of course, is not a big country, but you have a, quite a lot of role to play in the, in the regional and particularly those uh, regional 
uh, architect on the on those regional liberalization of the trade. I mean, uh, CPTPP, RCEP, and and DIPA is a good example. I I I pick one of your sentences, which is I think very interesting, is that. Uh, do we want the status quo? Maybe not really uh, uh, radical changes. I, I think, you know, we can improve gradually status quo, not radical exchanges is absolutely important. Uh, we, we hope that uh, we, we, we're still going to get this world going around rather than we quickly uh, uh, change that. So let's, let's stick to the, to the principles, uh, UN uh, uh, charters and, and, uh, and all, the, all the, you know, the, 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 the new wave of uh, geopolitical uh, uh, Tension and and the, 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 the you know the risk is uh, is uh, is probably uh, from China's point of view is is a, is a, a, you know quite a lot of status quo changes. So let's let's keep to to the to the, to the what we have actually and improve that. Thank you. So so I'd like to have uh, uh, next guest is uh, uh, our new ambassador actually from uh, Argentina and uh, he was just arrived here uh, two months ago. Uh, Excellency Marcelo uh, Salavi. Your turn, please. Uh, thank you very much, um, Dr. Um, Henry Wang, founder and president of DCG. Also, thank you for Marvel Liu Miao, Secretary General. I, I avail of the opportunity to congratulate you on this 10th uh, anniversary session of the forum. Um, I, I do believe this is a very important matter that we are discussing. Um, so I have some uh, written points that I would like to uh, read because that would make clear that uh, Argentina position is what I'm reading and then I would like to share with you some personal views. So um, uh, we do really believe that um, uh, multilateralism is the way to go in terms of uh, international um, issues and uh, the commitment of Argentina to multilateralism is uh, steadfast and unwavering. Um, we are a nation uh, deeply rooted in the principles of cooperation and diplomacy, and we recognize the importance of multilateral institutions in addressing global challenges and advocating for the peaceful, peaceful resolution of conflicts. Uh, we firmly believe that multilateralism serves as a cornerstone um, for fostering dialogue, uh, building consensus, and forging partnerships among nations to tackle pressing issues such as climate change, poverty, alleviation, international conflicts, and security. And uh, in this particular matter, the reform of the Security Council is key. And uh, as you know, Argentina is very actively working with some other like-minded countries in what we do believe is the better solution to address that, that important issue in the near future. Um, we do believe that pluralism acknowledges and respects the diversity of perspectives, interests, and values across nations, fostering an environment where multiple voices are heard and considered in shaping international policies and agreements. Uh, diplomacy, cooperation, and multilateralism play a key role in that regard. Um, but, you know, every country, and I am happy to uh, see in this round table um, the presence uh, of my colleague from South Africa, because uh, so far we, Argentina and South Africa, if I'm not wrong, we are the only two uh, countries from the South in this round, round table voicing our views and concerns. Uh, so uh, this is something that I would like also to reflect upon. Um, although multilateral institutions uh, have been built with an architecture that uh, may be reviewed for improvement currently, um, we also acknowledge that every country has its own perspectives. For instance, in the case of Argentina, we usually play our active roles in multilateral institutions firstly with our national position. This may sound obvious, but it's it's what it, what it is, and then, then we do um, identify ourselves with the immediate region. So we have to relate with our neighbors and try to coordinate among us positions to be uh, put forward in multilateral forum. So Argentina, first is Argentina. Secondly, it's a Latin American and Caribbean nation and country. And uh, we are also a developing country to put us in a broader group of uh, countries that are facing uh, real challenges that may differ from uh, 
interests and challenges faced by other group of countries. So the effect of societies will also determine our roles and positions in different uh, international organizations. So you will find um, groupings of uh, agriculture uh, countries versus un industrialized uh, countries. Some other forums will have groupings of, uh, what I said before, developing and developed countries. Some other groups will have uh, countries profiled under um, nuclear or non-nuclear countries, and so on and so. So that is something that will define the effectiveness of the discussions and also the delivery of uh, proper and actual actions in the field. Uh, something also that needs to be considered while thinking of a prospective reform of uh, the international architecture has to do uh, with the way that international organizations are shaped and to what extent the um, bylaws of the organization, for instance, regarding uh, different scales of contributions or what are the mandates given to its secretariats uh, will influence the outcomes of uh, that international agenda that we want to shape. Uh, for instance, there is quite a difference uh, between uh, the performance of um, international mechanisms that will perform guided by its own secretariat versus those uh, groupings of countries that uh, will rotate its um, pro tempore secretariat or chair every year or every uh, period of time. So there are a lot of ideas that need to be considered, not only in terms of how we can better deliver um, a better multilateral system in the future, but also uh, we have a lot of uh, lessons learned from our current uh, institutions in terms of uh, how they are performing and uh, to what extent uh, at some point um, some multilateral institutions which, in which we are all have the same voice and vote, but in terms of delivery, uh, as a result of uh, different scales of on contributions or earmark contributions that are influencing uh, the agenda that may be in the interest of, uh, of all. So I'm running out of time. Thank you very much again. And uh, I'm looking forward to the next uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Yes, excellent. I think you, you, you also said well. I mean, you, you talk about uh, uh, particularly Global South and, uh, and all, the, all the, you know, how we can really work together and uh, uh, to safeguard uh, global prosperity. And I think I agree, you know, probably we need more prosperity for development of the Global South. That is a cornerstone. If we really falling apart on the development, then the world will be really in chaotic situation. Uh, it can affect every country. So, so uh, Argentina is a big global south country, so <laughs> we appreciate your comment. Uh, next, I would invite uh, uh, my friend uh, Ambassador Hannes in a hand. So, he, you had all the hand on China. I know 20 years ago you studied in China, uh, in Chengdu, in Sichuan province. Uh, now, <laughs> we want to hear from you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Henry and uh, Mabel and CCG, for uh, offering us this wonderful uh, platform to uh, express our, our uh, views. Um, I quite liked what you said when uh, New Zealand Ambassador Graham Morton was uh, speaking when he said, New Zealand is a small country. Uh, compared to us, of course, it's huge. Uh, we are a country of only 1.3 million uh, people. I once had a meeting with the president of Vietnam, and he also called him, his country a small one. Um, so, you know, the point of reference is different in uh, comparing to where you, where you look from. But um, when um, in preparation for this meeting, uh, I, um, in mo this morning actually, I checked some concepts uh, on the internet. I googled them. So let me to introduce my points uh, first. Read, uh, an orderly multipolar world means that all should observe the purpose and principles of the UN Charter, uphold universally recognized basic norms that govern international relations. So in Estonia, uh, we are not looking to reimagine uh, anything uh, there. Uh, the UN as an organization is based on the principle of the sovereign equality of all its members. 
uh, regardless of the size, uh, big or small, uh, regardless of the geographical location, uh, north or south. Um, so for us, the UN Charter is the ultimate security uh, guarantee. We are, of course, members of the European Union, members of NATO, but we are a country of only 1.4 million, as I already said. So the ultimate security guarantee is the respect for the Charter. Hence, um, it is our absolute priority, nationally, internationally, that countries respect those fundamental principles. Um, of course, we do have the highest expectations for the UN Security Council members to uphold those principles. And of course, we know that it is not so. Um, Europe is now in its deepest security crisis since the Second World War, since Russia started its war of aggression against Ukraine in 2014, and then again in, in 2022. And again, back to the security, uh, back to the UN Charter, all members shall refrain in their international relations from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state. As Russia's immediate geographical neighbors, uh, we are particularly concerned as Russia is, of course, in fundamental violation of those uh, uh, principles. Um, we do not want to reimagine the world where aggression is rewarded, where the use of force to change internationally recognized borders, recognized by China, recognized by Russia, recognized by any country in the world, uh, where this forced change of borders is uh, accepted. In such a world, we will be walking straight into the abyss, and this is equally applicable, I think, again, regardless of the geographical position of the countries, north or south. So the issue is rather existential uh, for us uh, in our geographical uh, neighborhood. So those principles of territorial integrity and sovereignty must remain. Aggression as a tool of international relations must be discredited. I think in many ways we are at the crossroads uh, now. Uh, we all have to think very carefully about, about it. What sort of future do we want in the world? Sustainable peace cannot be achieved by accepting the results of territorial gain by aggression. I think it's pretty fundamental. And also, I think it's important to emphasize that sovereignty means all countries are entitled to choose their own future, their own destiny. Um, Ukraine is not an exception uh, here. Nobody from the outside, no third party, has a veto right over the sovereign choices of, of uh, this country. So let's not confuse who is the aggressor and who is the victim here. Russia is the aggressor. Ukraine is the victim. Um, UN Charter is not just declarations and uh, words. We must fight to apply or to uphold those. In Estonia, we do our absolute utmost to help Ukraine in this just cause, to regain its territory, to regain, regain um, its right for its sovereign, uh, sovereign uh, choices. We have had 4% of population increase in Estonia. As we're hosting so many Ukrainian refugees, mainly women, children. We have committed 0.25% of our GDP to annually uh, military, give military help to uh, uh, Ukraine because we want this help to be uh, predictable and systematic. And of course, it would be important to see China taking part uh, in these processes. You know, as we talk about multipolar world, China clearly is one center of the gravity uh, there. Hence, we would like to encourage China to take part in the Swiss-led peace summit taking place the very next month in, uh, in Switzerland. And achieving just peace, um, not only in, in Ukraine, also in the Middle East, would mean that we have, at least for the time being, put the genie back into the bottle and we can concentrate on important uh, challenges and topics for the planet. Development, prosperity for all environment, etc. I am, um, as a concluding remark, uh, 
somewhat uh, disturbed that uh, some see achieving uh, peace by Ukrainian terms uh, in this major conflict war taking place at the moment. Some see it as a North versus South issue. It is absolutely not so. I think all countries, big or small, North or South, have the same interest there. And I think it should be seen as a common goal in the true spirit of multilateralism. Thank okay. you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Hamis. Yes, I, I, I think that we, we really need to uh, th strengthen the um, multilateral system, UN system, particularly on the, on the security issues. Absolutely. And, uh, but also I think it's important that we, we have to engage in, in, in peace talks and in dialogues. And uh, I'm glad that uh, uh, Swiss, uh, Switzerland has organized another peace conference. They did one in Davos in January. I was there. And, uh, but, uh, but, but hopefully this time China will be uh, there. But also I think China and Turkey and, and many other countries hopefully proposing that we should have a dialogue including everybody you know, at the table. We can just uh, not one-sided talk about how to end uh, the, the, the conflict. I think we need everybody to be at the table. Uh, including Russia to, to talk about how we settle for the for the peace uh, for the for the conflict. Okay, uh, I have two experts from CCG, and I would like to hear their comment and their observations. And uh, I would like to invite Professor Xin Hong. He's a professor uh, of Institute of International Relations from Renmin University, but also a former counselor of the China State Council and CCG Academic Council member. So, uh, Professor Su, please. I thank you very much, uh, Chair, and uh, thanks for this significant chance of important discussion. I would like to talk about so-called chance camp and global interaction model. And that is various combination among urgency, degree of significance of issues, and the permanence of machinery. According to a rough empirical-based observation. First, let me talk about so-called strategic military field. Situation one, issues urgent and significant, but we found there is no permanent machinery. Situation two, not urgent, although quite significant. And we are regret to find that there is no machinery. Situation three, not urgent, as well as not significant. And there is no machinery. Or there is one, but almost empty. Finally, urgent, but not significant. We found that there is permanent machinery. Or there is no permanent The second is no strategic military field. Situation is not urgent, but significant. We found there is machinery, but open near to empty. The second, not significant, not, not urgent, not significant. And there are no machinery, or machinery is almost empty. Situation three, urgent and significant. We found that there is a parallel permanent machinery, especially G20. Finally, an urgent but not significant. We found that there is also something just like uh, the same permanent machinery or machinery but almost empty. Finally, especially in most recent years, we found a field of domestic politics. Issues urgent and significant, there is no permanent machinery. The situation too, not permanent, no, no, not urgent, but significant. There is no any machinery. And finally, there is not urgent issue as well as insignificant. There is no machinery. And the last two paragraphs of my talk.
conclusion about the matter like from a senior, at least seem to me, is in a world divided between great powers and their respective major partners, the prospect of effective and permanent multilateral machinery seems poor. There's a major starting step in practice if we want to boost the multilateral machinery in major fields of the world, which is theoretically, or even according to common sense, is so required. The major starting point, starting step, is great powers engaging in concrete rather than rhetorical talks about major disputes between or among them to see are there rooms for lasting mutual concessions. Anyway, the politics or sound politics is art of possibility. But we found the leaders of great powers in this world, today's world, have spent so much time to express in rhetoric terms for international prestige or domestic political interests. And, and uh, unfortunately paid so little concrete attention to deal with their mutual and concrete major disputes. Thank you for your patience. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor. So you have many scenarios and uh, many uh, uh, descriptions, uh, so, so we will we, we digest on the, on the uh, uh, prescription you have. But I absolutely I agree, and uh, you know, the, the current leaders in the world, we, we really have to address our you know, domestic uh, uh, challenges uh, uh, more you know, accurately, more urgently, rather than uh, we blame each other uh, for, for, for the problem. So uh, that's probably uh, is absolutely right. And particularly for the multilateral system, we need to work together to, to safeguard and, and at the same time uh, improve the domestic situation. I would like to have uh, Victor, uh, Victor Gao, he's uh, Vice President of CCG and has been with CCG for 16 years, but, but you were also a former interpreter for Deng Xiaoping you know, many, many years ago. So, Victor, please. Thank you, Henry. Yes, uh, working for Deng Xiaoping was my highlight. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next highlight is sitting here with all the ambassadors and all the <laughs> delegates to talk about this very important question. Allow me to make several points. I think the world order uh, established in 1945, immediately after the Second World War, was not designed to be a unipolar world. It was a world based on balance of power. And unfortunately, uh, in no time, it deteriorated into a Cold War, which didn't end until 1991. But even after 1991, it was not meant to be a unipolar world. Well, one big country held itself out to be the unipolar, that's for sure, but it was not in line with the international structure at that time. And therefore, what are the situation we are now? We are in what I would say post-post-Cold War era. And one thing is clear, it is multipolar world is now, and multipolar world is irreversible. That's the first point. The second point is whether there are forces in the world which want to reverse it back into a unipolar world, or, for example, to create mega, it's not make Argentina great again, <laughs> it's make America great again, and mega basically means the rest of the world is secondary and one country is on top of the world. Now, whether it's a slogan by Donald Trump or whether it represented the feelings in Washington, that's another issue. But I would say MAGA is really trying to pull the world back from a multipolar world into something else. And that something else is not possible. But then the tension between the realities on the ground and those forces which want to change the realities and pull the world back into something else is the tension of the world we are faced with. Now the other thing is, I completely agree with the ambassador from Germany. When we talk about 
the world order, it's a very sensitive issue. And if we look at the major players in the world, Russia says they want to recreate the world order. They want to smash the current one and recreate the new world order. China's position is very different. China does not want to destroy the international order we are living through. China wants to make improvements to whatever problems and defects there are in the international order and still continue to live with the international order. China has no desire at all to smash the international order as we are living in through. In that sense, again, I very agree with Ambassador Flaw's uh, sentiments about we need to be very careful, even in terms of making improvements. Now, if we do not make improvements to the international order, what will happen? One is that some forces will really try to reassert dominance above all the other countries. And I would say this will be very dangerous. And this will be just against the UN Charter, as several ambassadors just now mentioned. And therefore, my suggestion is that we really need to uphold the United Nations Charter and make sure that all the countries and the ambassadors the ambassador just now mentioned the size of Singapore or Estonia, etc. From the Chinese perspective, all countries are equal, whether Estonia, New Zealand, or Fiji, Palau, which doesn't uh, recognize the PRC now. Every country is the same. And I'm very impressed by the fact when the president of the Palestinian Authority, Abbas, visited China, he got the same protocol as all the other pre presidents from any other country. And I think many Palestinian friends uh, actually wept to see the high protocol. But from the Chinese perspective, because that was a president of a sovereign country, even though some other countries debate about that, therefore I think upholding the United Nations Charter and treat all the countries as equal. In that sense, I personally dislike the term Global South, but it seems as if the Global North is more superior than the Global South. All countries should be uh, equal. Now, the other point, allow me to mention very uh, briefly, is what uh, uh, Ambassador Hane or Hansa uh, mentioned about the sovereign choice uh, about Ukraine joining NATO. I'm not going to talk about it, but allow me to mention one thing, and I hope it will be behind the closed door, at least under Chatham House rule. Uh, about 12 years ago, there was a country to China's north and to Russia's south. I'm not going to name that country, but you'll figure that out immediately. That country wanted to join NATO. It started the preliminary process to join NATO. Eventually, that attempt was muzzled. I didn't mean someone said over my dead body, but that country was not going to join NATO at all. By stretching your imagination in whatever way that country is not going to join NATO. That country is a sovereign country, it's an independent country, it's a neighboring country of China, it's a neighboring country of Russia. Every year that country conducts joint military exercises with NATO, and many NATO member states, attaches, military attaches to Beijing, double up as military attaches to that country. And China respects that country, etc. But one thing is very simple that country will never be allowed to join NATO. Bear with me that point. And that has something to do with what Ambassador Hansel said. And I would say the world is very complicated. When we want to maximize protection of our own security, we really need to be sensitive about the sensitivities of the other countries. Because otherwise, I think you are not going to be constructive in many ways. Therefore, for the uh, war in Ukraine, allow me, and this is really a testing stone for the current world order, as well as the international order which may emerge from whatever that will happen to that war. I think China's position is right, and China's position is on the right side of history. That is from day one. China urged Russia and the Ukraine to stop the war immediately. And ever since then, for more than two years and a half almost, China has been calling on Russia to stop the war, calling on Ukraine to stop the war. And the accusation about China supplying weapons to Russia is false. Allow me to mention one thing without blowing it out of proportion. If China supplied weapons to Russia, 
the war will be over tonight. Basically, because Russia needed the weapons that China has, and China refused to supply Russia with the, that weapon. Maybe that's the reason why they, according to reports, need to go to DPRK, which is another very proud neighboring country of China, for weapons. And when you talk about supplying weapons, China exports bullets, the ammunition, to the United States. U.S. military imports Chinese-made drones, do you use drones for military purposes, as well as ammunition for military purposes, but China does not supply Russia with weapons. Why? Because China does not want to be involved in that war in that way. China wants to bring that war to an end. Yesterday I said we can imagine the war in Ukraine as a fire. When you have a fire, put out that fire immediately, rather than allow that to spread or to intensify. That's another point. Now, um, another thing about this uh, uh, NATO situation, we know this BRICS and we know this uh, uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, and we have the distinguished ambassador from Turkey. I personally believe Turkey should eventually apply for BRICS, uh, eventually. And hopefully, you know, it will be a good response to the fact that Turkey has been uh, repulsed from uh, joining uh, EU for all these decades. Now, imagine if someone eventually approached a country like Canada and tried to recruit Canada into SOE, SEO, do you think it will be constructive or not constructive? I think the Canadians will rise up in rebellion against that attempt. Is that right? The United States will lose its sanity. Why should the BRICS or SEO approach my northern neighbor and try to recruit Canada into SEO or BRICS? It doesn't make any sense. So I would say we should not look at the world issues in complete naivete. We need to be more sophisticated. We need to understand different layers of sensitivities, etc. For the war in Ukraine, allow me to make a final point. Let's bring that war to an end as quickly as possible. Let's do what, whatever we can. Now, whether China will send a delegation to Switzerland, I do not know, but China's position is clear. Any peace negotiation about the war in Ukraine need to have Russia and Ukraine present. Otherwise, it's not going to be constructive. Now, a very brief point about the United Nations. You know, I worked with the United Nations, and my family have very close connections with the United Nations. And I would say, without being the devil's advocate, I think the fact that, that no world war or the Third World War has broken out since 1945 does have something to do with this very complicated system of the United Nations Security Council involving the five permanent member states holding veto power. Now, without that system, I'm afraid the Third World War would have broken out much sooner and the world would have suffered great calamities. Therefore, while I agree with everyone, and China also wants to make improvements to the United Nations, I think we need to really understand why this very complicated five permanent member system, each holding a veto power, was created in 1945. It was created with a purpose to prevent another world war. But you may say the war in Ukraine is even worse, probably. And there have been so many regional wars, etc., creating calamities of all kinds. But the fact that ever since 1945, no global war, world war, has uh, broken out is, I think, very much thanks to the fact that the United Nations has this very complicated veto power. Now, I end by making several appeals. That is, I hope all countries in the world, about 200 of us, will need to focus on peace, embrace peace, because war is devastating. And the war in Ukraine may escalate into a nuclear war. That's the problem. We want to save Ukraine, that's for sure. And I traveled to Ukraine. I visited the Bucha. I visited the Irpin. They called me, one of the very few Chinese from China, visiting Bucha and visiting Irpin. But I do hope saving Ukraine should not be at the expense of losing mankind. 
So we need to be very philosophical. We want to save Ukraine. We want to end the war in Ukraine. But we do not want to see the escalation of the war from conventional war to nuclear war. And allow me to mention, I think China is the only country in the world today which was threatened to be wiped out by nuclear holocaust uh, by the former Soviet Union in 1969. China was the only country. Can you believe it? Therefore, from day one, I think the authorities in China looked at the war in Ukraine to say, holy cow, this war does have the ingredients of potentially escalating from a conventional war into a nuclear war. So China is being very cautious, like surgical precision. Calm down, calm down. No more fighting. Don't pour more fuel onto the fire. Why? Because someone is bombing the largest nuclear power station in Ukraine already, in Europe. That's very dangerous. And I think the fact that the Russians have been holding out the nuclear weapon again and again since day one is to be treated in a very careful way. We should not dismiss them. We need to be very carefully addressing that issue. Therefore, I think embracing peace, bring the war to an end, bring the war in Ukraine to an end, bring the war in Gaza to an end, and then let justice to take its own course. Justice has very long arm. It doesn't have an arm as short as mine. Be sure of that. Uh, therefore, I think uh, uh, we need to be very cautious in moving from the world of today into the world of tomorrow. And the world of tomorrow will be even worse. Why? Because we talked about AI. AI, if not regulated, will dominate mankind. And all of us homo sapiens may live in domination by AI. And that may happen very soon, uh, in a matter of five years, 10 years, 25 years, etc. Our children will grow up in a completely different world if mankind does not get our acts together. Embracing peace, embracing stability, bring the wars to an end, avoid any war, and let's improve international cooperation about AI so that mankind, homo sapien, will always be independent without being subjugated to AI. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank, thank you, thank you, Victor. And uh, I, I think we, we uh, you know, we have, we, we, because we have one expert to, to uh, you know, recoup some of those points the ambassadors made. I think it was very important. But, uh, but I think we have, uh, you know, probably run out of time. I know that uh, Mark have. Uh, you want to see a few words uh, before I came here? You know, we may have one observer from industry. So, if you want to say a few words. Thanks a lot for having me here, uh, President Wang, and uh, listening to this very important conversation. And I really applaud you all for this dialogue, right? Because I think the most important thing is to having this kind of dialogue. And as a representative here of uh, the oldest chemical pharmaceutical company in the world, uh, we've been in every country for more than 100 years now already. We're a 350 years old country, company with uh, healthcare, life science, and electronics. And for us, sustainable development of individual people is on, at the core. And what you're doing here is very important to create this governance, create the regulatory framework to help us to have stability, predictability, and transparency. Because only then we, as companies, together with the population, can work on the topic, pressing topics you all mentioned, like sustainability, climate change, and AI. And so listening to this was very humble for me, and uh, seeing the complexity uh, you're dealing with every day and really applaud and encourage you to continue this really difficult conversation Towards the benefit of all of us individually Okay, Th thank you. Thank you Mark. Uh, I know you're the, you're the president of uh, North China So at least from industry we hear some voices that really uh, cares about the world and, and in, you know attempts great importance of the peace and security I, I think we're running out of time because we uh, all together we have about uh, 10 ambassadors uh, I, I know uh, British Ambassador Caroline told me last night at our conference dinner that uh, she couldn't make it because uh, uh, the, the election is called in the UK and uh, she cannot be appeared in public uh, speaking role uh, for during this period of time. But I think today is, is a very good uh, process, very good exercise, and we have a uh, you know country's ambassador representative of, of a very uh, across the world, you know, from uh, uh, Europe and. Uh, 
uh, you know, a, a Asia and, uh, and Africa and, uh, and all the Middle East and everywhere. It's, it's really important that we have this kind of dialogue. And, uh, and we make this dialogue happen in China, and uh, that's, that's so important. We hear all the uh, 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 constructive uh, uh, points, and even though there are some differences uh, from time to time, but I think we have you know, all felt that uh, UN, right? UN rule, you know, when we talk about rule base, let's specify, it's UN rule. Uh, so let's, let's make it very clear, and China stick to the UN rule uh, strongly. And, uh, and also we, we felt that uh, there's a consensus that unipolar world is gone, and multipolar world is happening, but multilateral system to support this multipolar world is still missing, and in the process of uh, shaping, it's so difficult. Uh, you, you know, we have more players now, and we are working on this process. I think China is, is willing to work with uh, all other major uh, players, and, and including Global South. And uh, so we, want to, we didn't want to see a polarized world. We don't, we don't want to see a bipolar world, uh, which is uh, we have a different system, different uh, digital <laughs> arrangement, different uh, uh, co company, different technology. And then that's really uh, going to stop the, the global, globalization benefits we've been having for the uh, last number of years. So, so I think this, this kind of exercise is, is, uh, is very important. I, I feel we're having a little small UN meeting <laughs> with all the participating, and uh, so we hopefully we can contribute. I mean, this conference uh, is, is very comprehensive and very diversified, and uh, I really appreciate uh, uh, all the participants uh, this morning. Uh, you know, sacrifice your Sunday morning, <laughs> as Ambassador Toledo told me. Uh, I, I'm to be blamed uh, for... for uh, getting this on Sunday morning, but I really appreciate all your time and contribution. We're going to document and, and summarize well, and we want to, uh, you know, uh, report to the different uh, departments and, uh, and government, and of course to uh, all the uh, think tank um, community that this is very constructive, very uh, meaningful, and very timely discussion, and I really appreciate all your contributions. Thank you very much, and uh, we hope we can still have some exchanges at the tea break. Again, thank you. Appreciate it.